Okay, so today we're going to do one of my favorite things in all of calculus one and some whole section on optimization problems. Optimization problems are also sometimes called applied maximum and minimum problems. So basically we're going to take all the information we've already learned about how to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum in certain situations and apply them to real life. So we all know when you hear the word applied and math, it's time for word problems. So this entire video is all about using calculus to solve word problems involving maximum and minimum values. So how do we attack these word problems? Well, first I'm gonna give us some steps to outline a general procedure for doing this. And then we're going to step-by-step, step, very slowly and very thoroughly do two of these types of problems, just to get an idea for how it works. So our steps for solving optimization problems. The first step, which honestly is the step most people struggle with, is actually understand the problem. So what I mean by that is read the problem thoroughly. Figure out what it is that they're telling you, what it is that you know, what it is that you're trying to find out and write down all of the things you know and what it is that your goal is for the problem. Step number two, it's optional, but I highly recommend step two, draw a picture. Sometimes having a picture of the situation helps you picture what's going on a little bit better and you'll be able to come up with the equations that you need a little bit easier. Step number three, you need to introduce some notation. Generally, this is just coming up with different variables and what the variables mean. It is very important to make sure you know what your variables are standing for. And if you're doing these problems for a class, it's very important to inform your instructor what your variables stand for. Otherwise, we'll just see x's and y's and not know what you're talking about. So you should define things like let x equal the width of the rectangle, you know, things like that, so it's very clear what you are talking about. Step number four, express what we want to maximize or minimize. In terms of the other variables. So basically what we're doing there is we're trying to write an equation, an equation that relates the thing we're trying to find in terms of all of the other information in our problem. Now, one of the things that's very complicated on these types of problems is sometimes you have way too many variables. It's kind of hard to figure out what to do. If you have more than one variable, you should try to use all of the information you have to rewrite one variable in terms of another variable so you can substitute all that information into the equation you're trying to optimize and so that you only have one variable to work with. That will make more sense once we get to an example. Then my very last step after I set up this equation that I'm trying to find, the maximum and minimum of, very last step would be to actually find the absolute max or the absolute min. Now, of course, this last step here actually takes quite a while because that's doing all the things we've already learned. That's finding the critical values by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero or finding when my derivative is undefined. And then it's figuring out if those critical values correspond to a maximum or a minimum, either by checking the signs of my derivative on either side of the critical value to see if it switches from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, or using that second derivative test that we learned very recently. All right, so we need an example right away of what are these problems that we're trying to do in this section. In our first example, 
we're going to be working with perimeter and area. So we have a farmer. And the farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing. And this farmer wants to fence off a rectangular field. that borders a straight river. No fence is needed along the river. What are the dimensions? of the field that has the largest area. All right, so the first step in doing all of our max and min problems, all of our optimization problems, is to understand the question. So what's going on here? We have a farmer who's trying to fence in this rectangular field. They only need to put fence along three sides of the field because the fourth side has a river and I guess whatever animal they're fending inside of this pen here doesn't go into the water so we can't escape through the river side. So we only need fence along three sides of this rectangle and we know we have 2,400 feet of fence we can use to do that. The farmer, of course, wants the biggest area possible for whatever it is they're putting in this field, whether it's animals to graze or maybe they're planting some crops there, but they want the biggest amount of area enclosed by this fence. So the first thing we should do after talking about what's going on here is draw a picture. If we draw a picture, we might be able to understand the situation a little bit better. So I know that I have a rectangular field, and I know that there's a river on one side of this field. So I'm just gonna say, here's my river up at the top. And I have a rectangular field. And I'm going to come up with some variables for this field. So I'm gonna have X be the width, and y be the length. And of course, since this is a rectangle, I have x over on that side of the rectangle too. So technically in this lovely picture I've been through, I have drawn a picture and also done the next step of introducing my notation. I have x being the width of the rectangle and I'm clearly indicating what I mean by the width in my drawing. And I have y as the length of this rectangle. And so now I need to try to write down all the things that I know and figure out how I'm going to maximize the area. So what is the equation for the area of a rectangle? Well, that's my length times my width. So I have x times y is my area. And I'm gonna put a star by this guy because that is the equation that eventually I'm going to want to maximize. I want the maximum area so eventually I'll be taking the derivative of that area equation in order to find the absolute maximum. But we have not used all the information in our problem yet. And also notice that this formula right here has two variables in it, and it would be way easier to deal with derivatives if we could just have one variable in the problem. So I'm gonna think about what other info I had in the problem and come up with another equation that I can use to figure out what y is in terms of x or what x is in terms of y, whichever one ends up being easy. Well, when we're talking about a rectangle here and we're talking about putting a fence around it, the other logical thing that we know is the perimeter. Now, it's not exactly the perimeter of a rectangle because I don't need fence along the river, but it's sort of a perimeter. I'm going to have 
this x plus y plus another x, so that's 2x plus y, is equal to the amount of fence that I have. And the problem told me I had 2,400 feet of fencing that I could use. So that is another equation. Now, when I look at that equation, can I solve for one of my variables in terms of the other? Yeah, and I can solve for either one in terms of the other one, but I'm gonna go ahead and just solve this for y because then I can do it in just one step. So using this equation here, I get that y is equal to 2400 minus 2x. So what can I do with that information? Well, I can take this information here, y equals 2400 minus 2x, and plug it into the equation that I'm trying to maximize. So we have area is equal to x times y, which means area is x times 2400 minus 2x. And this is now a nice equation for area that only has one variable in it. So now I can go about trying to find the absolute max or absolute min, but in this problem we want the absolute max since we're trying to find the maximum area that can be enclosed by this fence. So this equation here is the one I'm going to take the derivative of. Now, I don't want to erase too much. We're going to need some of this information later. In particular, we're going to need y equals 2400 minus 2x. Because I'm trying to find the dimensions for this rectangular field that maximizes the area. That means I need to know what x is and I need to know what y is. Finding my critical values and finding the max is going to give me my x value. To get the y value, I'll have to use that equation. So let me erase my picture. I'm just going to write the equation I'm going to need later. Y equals 2400 minus 2x up here so I can reference it later. But now all that I need is this area equation and we're going to try to find the maximum. So we need to maximize area equals x times 2400 minus 2x. To find the absolute maximum, we can, we're going to have to start by finding our critical values. That means I need to find the derivative of this and figure out whether that's equal to zero or undefined. Now, the way it's written right now, we can do the derivative using the product rule, but it's probably a little bit easier to distribute this x and then end up just using the power rule to find the derivative. So when I distribute, I get my area is 2400x minus 2x squared. So if I'm going to find my critical values, first I take my derivative. A prime is equal to 2400 minus 4x. And I want to find when my derivative is equal to zero or undefined. Well, this guy's not going to be undefined. It's just a nice polynomial, so it's defined for every x value. So I just need to find where it's equal to zero. So I can solve that by adding 4x to the other side and then dividing by 4 to get 600. Now, here is a part that students tend to forget to check, and it's very important to check this next step. I got that my critical value is 600, and it's my only critical value. We're trying to find a maximum, so I would hope that this gives me a maximum for my area, but we need to actually verify that this does give me a maximum. Why is it important? Well, imagine that this farmer hired you for this job, trying to maximize the area of this field he's fencing off, and you say you need to have x be 600, and they build this, and they find out you actually minimize their area instead of maximize it you would be out of business and you'd probably get sued for that. So we need to make sure that we do actually have a maximum because we don't want to tell somebody the wrong information. So I have x equals 600 and I want to verify that this gives me a maximum. I'm gonna 
use that second derivative test that we learned in the last video, just because it's usually pretty quick to do. So using my second derivative test, I'm going to take the second derivative of my area, which would get me negative four. And then I see what happens when I plug my critical value into that second derivative. Well, it doesn't matter what I plug into that second derivative. I still get negative four, which is less than zero. And that means that this is indeed a maximum using that second derivative test. So I do have that x equals 600 does give me a maximum. That's good news. We've done all the hard work for this problem. Now I just need to figure out how to write my answer. They were asking for the dimensions of the field that we need in order to maximize the area. So that's what is x equal to and what is y equal to. We have x is 600. To find y, I use this formula that I wrote down up on the top because I knew I might need it. Y is equal to 2400 minus 2 times my X. So 2400 minus 1200 is 1200. So the dimensions of my field are 600 feet by 1200 feet. And there's the answer to our problem. Not too terrible. So that is how you would find the maximum in a situation where we just have a two-dimensional rectangle and we're finding the maximum area using the perimeter to help us along the way. But we can also do things like this with three-dimensional objects. And our next example is actually going to maximize, well, not maximize, we're going to minimize the cost to produce a can that has the certain amount of volume to it. So let's do another optimization problem, but this time it's going to be a three-dimensional problem. So example. A cylindrical pan is to be made to hold one liter of oil. Find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the metal to manufacture the can. So I have a can that's going to hold a certain volume of one liter of oil. And I'm trying to minimize how much it costs to make this can. That means I'm trying to find a can that uses the least amount of metal possible because the less metal I use, the cheaper it is for me to make this can. So let's just draw what a can looks like. Here's a nice cylindrical can. It has some radius, R, and some height, H. Oh, let me just label my radius right there. R and H. And we're going to need an equation for the volume of this can, as well as an equation for the surface area. The surface area is talking about the area of all of the metal that makes up the can. So that's the area of the two circles, top and bottom, and the area of this tube piece that makes up the tube part of the can. So things that we know, well, the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi 
R squared H. That's the volume of a cylinder. And in this particular problem, I know my volume is supposed to be one liter. And one liter, I'm gonna turn this into 1,000 cubic centimeters. That's something that might be a little bit tricky when we're working on these problems. They gave me my volume in terms of liters, but I want this information in some sort of units for measurement because I want my final answer to give me measurements for this can. So I converted my one liter into 1,000 cubic centimeters so that I can then use centimeters for the measurements of my can. If you don't necessarily know all the conversions between different types of units, you can always Google them for the appropriate problems and figure out exactly what it is that you need. So this is something that I know. My volume is 1,000 cubic centimeters, which is the same as one liter. And I want to minimize my surface area. So let's figure out what the surface area is of this pan. Well, I'm gonna have the area of the two circles. Area of a circle is pi r squared. And I have two of those. So that's two pi r squared. And I need to add to that the area of the two part of my can. So to figure that out, imagine cutting the can vertically and then unfolding it. So let me just do that with my paper here. Picture having a can like that. There's the tube of my can and I'm going to slice it and open it up and we get a rectangle. So the area of that rectangle is going to be h for part of it and the other side of the rectangle is the circumference of the circle which is 2 pi r so i have 2 pi r h to give me the surface area of the tube part of that cylinder so this surface area here i'm going to put a star by that because that is what i'm going to try to minimize I want to use the least amount of metal possible in this problem. The unfortunate part of this is I have too many variables right now. I have R's and H's, and it would be super convenient if I could just have one variable in it for when I'm trying to find the derivative. How do we find just one variable for this problem? Use the other equation. I'm going to solve my volume equation for one of my variables in terms of the other. It does not matter which variable you solve for, so I suggest you always try to choose the easiest way. On this problem, solving for the height is the easiest because I just have to divide by pi on the square. So let me erase this. So looking at my pi r squared h equals 1,000, I can solve for h by dividing by my pi r squared. And this can be plugged in to my surface area equation. When I plug that in for my h, I'm going to have an equation for surface area that only involves r. Then I can find the minimum of that by taking my derivative. So plugging that into my surface area equation, let me just call that A for area. I have 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r and my h. h is now equal to 1,000 over pi r squared. So let me simplify this a little bit. A is 2 pi r squared plus, I'm going to have my pi's cancel out and one of the r's cancels out. So I'm going to have a 2,000 over r. And I'm going to want to take a derivative of this. So I'm going to rewrite that dividing by r as r to the negative one power. So I can just use my power rule to take the derivative. So my surface area is 2 pi r squared plus 2,000 r to the negative 1 power.
And now I'm ready to actually find the derivative of this guy. Now, I'm going to need more room to do that, so let me just click up in this upper corner, write down the equation I had for my h, because we know if we need the dimensions at the very end, I'm going to need to find out what h is at the end of the problem. So I don't want to lose that information. All right, so now we're finally ready to find the minimum. So we're going to minimize my a equals 2 pi r squared plus 2,000 r to the negative 1. And I'm going to do that by first finding my critical values. I find my critical values by taking the derivative and finding when my derivative is 0 or where it's undefined. So taking the first derivative with the power rule, my 2 comes down and multiplies, so I get 4 pi r to the first. And then that negative 1 comes down and multiplies. And my new power is 1 sm smaller, so I have a negative 2,000 r to the negative 2. That's my derivative. Now, to figure out where this is 0 or undefined, first notice that if I rewrite this without negative exponents again, I'm dividing by an r squared over here. So I know that my derivative is undefined when that r happens to be 0, because I'd be dividing by 0. But let's think about the context of the situation. Am I going to have a radius of 0 on a can that's holding some oil? No. You wouldn't have a can with radius 0. That doesn't even make sense in the real world. So I can ignore the fact that that r equals 0 is a critical value because it does not match the context of this problem. So I don't need to worry that we're undefined because it doesn't make sense in the real world. I only need to figure out where this derivative is equal to 0. Now there's a lot of ways to solve this. I personally really don't like that fraction over there. So I would multiply everything in my equation by r squared to get rid of that fraction. 0 times r squared is still 0. My 4 pi r times r squared is 4 pi r cubed. And my 2,000 over r squared is just 2,000. So now I have this equation to solve, which looks a little less scary to me. To solve this equation, we're going to add the 2,000 to the other side. Then I'm going to divide by 4 pi, and then I'll take the cube root at the end. All right, so when I divide by 4 pi, I'm going to get that, I get 2,000 divided by 4, which is 500 over pi equals r to the third. That's what I get when I divide by that 4 pi. And now to get my r, I just have to take a cube root of both sides. And I get the cube root of 500 over pi is equal to my radius. Now, that's a pretty disgusting number, but that's OK. Because it doesn't matter if it's ugly. It just matters if it works. So this should be my radius, the cube root of 500 divided by pi, whatever in the world that is. But remember, we need to make sure that this gives us a minimum. We need to verify that this gives us a minimum. And one way to do that is the second derivative test. So for our second derivative test, remember that our first derivative was equal to 4 pi r minus 2,000 r to the negative 2. And if I take my second derivative, I'm going to get 4 pi plus 4,000 r to the negative 3. 
So I'm trying to find what is a double prime of my really disgusting looking critical value. Well, it's going to be 4 pi plus 4,000 over r to the third. Well, r to the third is going to cancel out that cube root. So I'm going to get 4,000 divided by 500 over pi, which I don't even know what that is, but that's okay because what I do know is 4 pi is positive, and a positive number divided by a positive number is going to be positive. So this whole thing is positive, bigger than zero. The second derivative test tells me that when that second derivative is bigger than zero, we do in fact have a minimum. So we're good. That means we found our critical value and it does in fact give us a minimum surface area for this can. But we're not quite finished yet. We were asked to find the dimensions of this can, and all we found so far is the radius of the can. I also need to have the height. So what we know now is our surface area is minimized. when the radius r is the cube root of 500 over pi. And all I need to finish the problem up is figure out what my height is. My height will be 1,000 divided by pi r squared, so pi times my cube root of 500 over pi squared. And I got this formula based on what I had up in the box up there, telling me what my height is in terms of my radius. Can't really do a heck of a lot to simplify that. I probably wouldn't simplify it very much at all. Um, I would just leave my answer as 1,000 divided by pi times 500 over pi to the two-thirds power. That's probably where I would leave it. It does simplify a little bit nicer. If you pair to simplify your answers, it would be 2 times the cube root of 500 over pi centimeters. So I have that this can had the least amount of metal to make it when the radius was the cube root of 500 over pi centimeters, and my height was two cube root of 500 over pi centimeters. Um, that's about it for today. So that shows you how we can use this absolute max and absolute min that we've already learned for just graphs of functions to actually find applications in real life. We can maximize area, we can maximize volume, we can minimize surface area, minimize perimeter, minimize distance. There's a lot of different things we can do, and they all follow those same steps outlined at the beginning. Understand the problem, write down everything you know, draw a picture and define some variables, write an equation relating what you're trying to find in terms of your variables, and then find the max and min by finding your critical values and verifying with the second derivative test or by another method that you actually have a maximum or a minimum value. If you have any questions on these problems, feel free to drop a comment down below. Or if you're in my classes currently, you can ask those questions through email or through my office hours. And I will see you guys next time.